Hello, Wallen Church. I hope you know by now that when you come to church, when you participate in a worship service, all of it is worship, right? All of it is worship, not just the singing. The prayer is worship. The giving is worship. Obviously, the songs are worship. The sermon is worship. And I, as the pastor, I have a very unique position in that I'm here the whole day, right? I don't come for an hour and then leave. I, I'm here for both services. We have a 9.30 uh, traditional service with a the choir. They sing hymns. We do responsive readings. We say uh, the Lord's Prayer. We take communion. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary worship service. We have a worship band. People come a little bit more relaxed. And you know what? In both of those, I can worship. I can worship because it's getting to the point where I can't even tell them apart anymore because I'm using that time to draw closer to God. So I'm not thinking about the style of music. I'm thinking about the words that are being said. I'm thinking about my posture. This fall season, we've been talking about joy. And I hope that as you've gone through this series with us. You've felt more joy this week? I hope so. In fact, I hope you sprung out of bed on Sunday morning and you rushed off to your church because you were filled with joy, because God's house is a place of joy. So don't, don't go to church with fake joy. That doesn't even make sense. Don't, don't put on a fake smile. Don't pretend to have joy. Let's come to worship every week knowing, expecting to find joy. I miss this during the week. I do. I miss church during the week. I miss you during the week because there's nothing better on earth. There's nothing more fulfilling than having a relationship with God. And there's nothing more rewarding than getting to spend that time in worship with you. Last week, we said that joy is something that you fight for because the world outside wants to rob you of joy because there's distractions out there, there's darkness out there, there's uh, hate and there's division. All those things live out there. So joy is not automatic. You're not owed joy. So how did you do? How did you do last week? Did you find more ways to be joyful? Because if you didn't, then did you obey the scriptures? Remember, we've been reading passages of the Bible for the past three weeks, talking about how we need to be people of joy. They were commands. And you, re you remember them. Right? You remember all those passages, right? No? No, you don't remember all of them? <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's, um, let's make it easy. Okay, let's make it easy. Uh, you remember those cheat sheets that you used to make for yourself back in school that would help you remember something? Let's make one right now, okay? How do you claim more joy in your life? Fight for more, more joy in your life. We read Psalm 71, 8, my mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. And we said the application to that was to sing, right? To worship, that we can find more joy when we sing. Second, we read Philippians 4, 8, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And we said the application here was to meditate on better things, right? Think about better things, holy things. We read Philippians 4, 6, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. That one's obvious, right? Be anxious for nothing. In other words, don't worry. And then we also read Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. That one's also obvious. Rejoice always. Ephesians 5, 20, reminded us to give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thankful people are joyful people, so we offer thanksgiving for everything. 
And then last, Ephesians 5, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. We should speak to others about the great things that God is doing in our life. And we're going to talk a lot more about that one today. Can you, can you remember all that? Can you remember those verses? I'll make, it, I'll make it even easier for you. Sing, meditate on good things, anxious for nothing, rejoice always, thankful for everything, and speaking to others about him. That's the smart way to live. S-M-A-R-T-S. Okay, that's the smart way to live. In other words, it doesn't just fall into your lap, right? You have to fight for every moment of joy. Because the minute I stop obeying, the minute I stop following that list, I will think myself sad. I'll think myself mad. I'll, I'll become depressed, frustrated, argumentative. The Holy Spirit wants you to have spiritual joy. So choose it. Choose it every single day. Today we're going to be looking at the opening line from 1 John. 1 John is right after the book of James and Peter in the New Testament. If you've hit Jude or Revelation, you've gone too far. 1 John 1 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. What is going on? How does he... How does he start like this? Why, why is John writing like this? Well, John is dealing with false teaching in his time. In particular, he's dealing with a particular form of heresy called Gnosticism. Basically, Gnosticism teaches that anything that is of the spirit is good, and anything of the physical is bad, is sinful, completely bad. And that led to people completely rejecting the idea that Jesus was physical, that he was a human. And that led to all kinds of other strange beliefs about Jesus. Some of the Gnostics even believed that Jesus only appeared to have a body, like he was a hologram. So part of John's purpose for writing this was to confront and correct those false teachings. And to do that, he says, I saw him with my own eyes, I heard him with my own ears. I touched him with my own fingers, right? He was a real person. In the movie uh, Jurassic Park, there's a powerful moment when paleontologist Alan Grant comes face to face with a real, live, prehistoric dinosaur. He has devoted his entire life to dinosaurs. But when he comes face to face with one, he suddenly falls to the ground and he's dumbstruck. Because it's one thing to study a book about dinosaurs. It's one thing to pick through fossils and bones about dinosaurs. It's one thing to picture, maybe, what a dinosaur might look like in your head, but when you're standing in front of an actual, physical dinosaur, there would be nothing like it. Likewise, for many people, Christianity amounts to picking through the artifacts of our faith. They have survived from long ago, and they come to us from far away, and and we read about Jesus, and we wear a cross, and we try to imagine what it would have been like back in his day, but that's as far as our faith goes. Please don't do that to yourself. If you want a real fellowship with Christ, if you want real joy, if you want that delight of intimacy in relationship with what John calls the words of life. If you want the pleasure of companionship in him, then you must experience him personally, like John talks about here. If you want that joy of sharing in his life, by faith, you reach out and touch him today. Get to know him personally intimately, like John encourages, experience the word of life for yourself. And then don't keep him to yourself. If you want to increase that joy, once you've experienced him, then share him with others. Next, John writes, the life was made manifest and we have seen it 
and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. John and his friends have found great joy in knowing the Lord personally. They found great joy in hearing, in seeing, in touching Jesus. They found great joy in their experience with Christ. But they also wanted to complete that joy, to make their joy full, and to be filled with even more joy. How? How do they do that? By sharing Jesus with others. Do you know why I'm writing this, John says? John says, because I have a relationship with God. I have a relationship with the creator of the universe, he says. He calls me his bride. He calls me his son. And I get to talk to him. I get to know him. And, he says, it would make my joy complete if you knew him too. But is that what brings us joy? Nah. Most of us want to be rich, right? We want to be comfortable. We want to be relaxed. We want to be stress-free. We want to retire well off. But John says, you know, if I could die just knowing that my friends and family know Jesus, then I can die happy because I just want everyone to feel the same joy that I feel. Friends, I think we were fed the wrong story growing up about evangelism. It's not about going door to door and converting strangers. It's about caring for the people in your life, your family, your community. I mean, think about how it works even in a restaurant, right? The paid wait staff, they are supposed to tell you about the special of the day. And maybe you order it, maybe you don't. But if you see the couple next to you order it, and you see their faces when it's brought out, and you see the food that's on their plate, and you see the joy on their face when they eat it, then you will say, I'll have what they're having. That's evangelism. That's evangelism. Evangelism is seeing and hearing and touching and then wanting to identify with that. You want that for yourselves. Identity, right? Identity is huge right now in our culture, isn't it? How do you identify? Listen, going forward, the gospel is not going to be won by reason or facts, or who has the strongest argument, we're not even going to win on the morality front. We're not. But if people see your joy, if they hear your graciousness, if they feel your love, they will want to identify with that. They will want to know the source of that. And as John points out, the joy that wins people to Jesus takes place in the fellowship that we have with others. And I know, fellowship, fellowship, it's one of those Christian words, right? But it's one that we should take very seriously. Notice John says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father, and with his son, Jesus Christ. John reminds us that this time that we spend here at church, it's not just, it's not just fellowship with God, and it's not just fellowship with each other, right? It's both. It's not this or that. It's both. You know, according to the census, Montgomery County is number eight out of the fastest growing cities 
in the state of Texas. Number eight, Montgomery County added 165,000 people in 10 years. Between 2010 and 2020, that's a growth rate of 36%. That means going forward, more homes are gonna be built, more schools are gonna be built, and more churches, more churches, if you can believe it. That means more schools, more churches to meet the needs to meet the needs of all the new people that will be moving here. And as of right now, we're the only church on this peninsula. We're here to meet the spiritual needs of the people that live off of Walden Road. How are we going to do that next year? What's our plan? Or the year after that? Because it can't just be my plan. It can't just be your board's plan. It has to be our plan. We have to all be in this together. I mean, still, right now, in attendance, we're we're down by about 50 people every single week. 50. Before COVID, we were averaging 200. Now we're averaging about 150. And I can tell you exactly who it is that's not coming anymore. It's our young families and our children. Most of them never came back after COVID. So what are we going to do to reach them? I can give you a super easy first step. Fellowship. Fellowship. Going out of your way to meet new people, to shake hands, to learn names. It means going to coffee and donuts even if you don't like coffee or donuts. It means helping to greet a service when people come in, a service that's not your service. It might mean helping out with youth or helping out in the nursery or helping out in the kids department. It might mean volunteering for trunk or treat. You know, we have trunk or treat on Halloween. It's a Monday night. We're going to be here from five to seven and we need people to sign up to be cars. It means volunteering for a parent's night out. It means volunteering to help with a date night. It means when you have a planning meeting in your ministry, and you're all sitting around the table and you're saying, okay, what are the things we're going to do? It means you ask, hey, what are the ways we can meet the needs of the people who live in our neighborhood? Is there a way we can meet the needs of working families? Why? Why should you care so much about other people? Why care about young families? I mean, why do I care if 50 people don't attend our church anymore. That's their loss, right? I am, I'm here. I go to church for me and my relationship with God. John tells us why in verse four. He says, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Meaning it's not enough. It's not enough. One or the other, it's not enough. Fellowship isn't fulfilled if it's just hanging out with people. And fellowship isn't fulfilled if it's just hanging out with God. It has to be both. It's both. John says completeness. Your Bible might even say fullness, right? It's, it's the filling of both. You need both to be filled. This opening paragraph of 1 John, it's a math equation. Really, it's a math equation. If you look closer at it, he says, Jesus was real. Jesus was here. We touched him. We heard a real message. And that gave us joy. So naturally, I want to tell you, I want to tell the people that I have a relationship with Jesus. So evangelism equals fellowship. And then knowing that you now have a relationship with God equals joy. It takes me right back to joy again. It's a full circle of joy. It's full joy, right? John says complete joy. And knowing him cuts through all that darkness. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off 
have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. I said right at the top of all of this that we focus on the wrong things, right? And we allow the outside world to rob us of joy. We do. We give it away. And on Sunday, we'll come through those doors, and then we're still thinking about our week. We're thinking about our circumstances. We're thinking about all the areas where we are deficient. We're thinking about what people have done to us, what people have said to us. We're worried about how we could prosper. We're trying to get ahead. And we're allowing all those dividing walls of hostility to take away our joy. When you talk to others at church, at work, at home, are you talking about joyful things or stressful things? Are you talking about things that pit people on one side of the conversation and the other? Do you refer to other people as they and them and those people? What's sad is most of that garbage that we talk about, it's not even our, ours to control. This is not how you should waste your life. Instead, choose joy. Fight for joy. Can you find joy this morning because you're saved and set free and forgiven? Can you find joy this morning because your name is written in the book of life? Can you find joy this morning because the Lord meets and exceeds, right, all your needs? Can you know joy because God says that he sends his son ahead of you to go and prepare a place for you so that you can be with him forever? John experienced it. He called it the word of life. On September 11th, 2001, when the now plane crash into the Pentagon office took place, a man named Isaac Haopi was an officer. He was nearby. He was outside the building. And immediately, he started to help people, anybody who was struggling, to get out of the building. And in some cases, he would rush in and he would carry people out. But Isaac wanted to do even more. He was, only had a short-sleeved blue police officer's uniform on. He didn't have a mask. He didn't have a protective coat. He didn't even have a handkerchief over his face. He ran into smoky ink blackness of the Pentagon. And he would yell, we got to get people, he shouted. He suffocated on smoke. And he heard the building crack. And he would shout out, is anybody in here? Anybody here? Wayne Sinclair and five co-workers, they were crawling through the rubble and they had lost all sense of direction and they heard Isaac's voice and they cried out and Isaac responded. Head toward my voice, he said. Head toward my voice. So following his voice, Sinclair and the others made their way through that crumbling Pentagon building. Isaac's words in that moment were literally the words of life to those people. And in the very same way, Jesus is the word of life to anyone who would listen to him. In fact, he is the only way to life. He is the only way to an eternal and abundant life. And it begins the moment you learn to put your trust in him. John our author and his friends, they had experienced that life. And he begins this letter by saying, I experienced it in real flesh and blood. I touched Jesus. He was the word of life. And he says that gave him joy. And he wants others to experience that same joy. And he says, if they can experience that same joy because of me, then that makes my joy complete. 
Last Sunday, the Dallas Cowboys beat the Commanders 25 to 10. And then the week before that, the Cowboys beat the Giants 23 to 16. And you know what? Out of the blue, my dad called me to tell me that he watched the Giants game with a friend. He said they had snacks, they watched the whole game. He said, I've never done that. I've never watched the game with a friend, with snacks, watched the whole game through. He said, I'd never done that in my entire life. And the reason why he did it was because his friend invited him. His friend was doing it, so he did it. My dad found joy watching the game because it was an opportunity to live that game with his friends. And then he called to tell me about it, to share that joy with someone else. That's evangelism. That's all it is. That's evangelism. Because there is joy in victory, right? Cowboys won. The Cowboys won. There is joy in victory. But there is even greater joy in the telling of the victory, right? Oh, the story you tell afterwards. It's even better. So it is when we experience Jesus Christ, there is a wonderful joy in the experience, but there's an even greater joy in the telling of the experience. There's no greater joy. There is no greater joy than sharing Christ with people and watching them respond, watching them put their faith in him. There is no greater thrill. And I pray that all of you have that experience, not just once, but many times in your life. Do you really want to live? To find fellowship, to find joy with the word of life, find delight and intimacy in having a relationship with Christ, find the pleasure of companionship, fellowship with him, like John says, to have complete joy complete joy first by faith when we experience Christ personally and then by fellowship when we share him with others let's pray Lord what a great time to have this moment of worship with you this whole experience that we call church is our time of fellowship with you, but also with each other. Lord, help me to be not so focused about my own needs and my own life when I walk through these doors, but to be equally focused about those who are walking in with their struggles. May I be a smiling face, an extended hand, a warm embrace. May I be the type of person who remembers names and welcomes and greets and loves and encourages because I have joy. And each person that walks through those doors, each person that I come in contact with this week, I want them to experience the same joy that I feel in Jesus Christ. I want them to know. I want my goal to come alongside your goal, to see every knee bow, to see every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Make my joy complete. Make my joy complete. I know there's names and faces of people in my life, in my community, that as of yet do not know the Lord. And so I pray for them right now. Perhaps all they need is a phone call or an encouragement from me that says, hey, come with me Sunday to watch the game, to have a moment, to show them where my joy comes from, to show them the source of my joy. Lord, help this church reach more families. Reach out to the young families that have drifted away from not just this church, but every church across the world. As little children and their parents are finding new ways to be busy 
new ways to be obligated on Sunday mornings, remind them of the joy they felt. Encourage them in their hearts to come back and to begin to fill churches once again with youth and vigor. Lord, we need them and they need us because we are the body of Christ and together we build each other up. We ask all this in your son's precious name. Amen. Hey, it's still October. It is still October, and we're going to have trunk or treat for the community on Halloween Day, on Monday, Monday from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Not a minute earlier, not a second later. We're going to be giving out candy. We're going to have the fire truck from the community. Chick-fil-A is going to be there. They're going to be setting up a little shop, and they're going to have chicken sandwiches and stuff for you. We're going to have a magician doing magic tricks. We're going to have a face painter. We're going to have bounce houses. We're going to have lots and lots of candy. Bring your little ones and your young at heart from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. It's free. It's open to the community. It's our way of giving back. We love you guys, and we'll see you soon. Bye.